Grace, mercy, and peace to each of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church on a gorgeous spring day. Remember last week we said where's spring? It's here. <laughs> really glad that you're here today. If you're visiting with us today, we're especially glad you're here. Please let us know if there's anything we can do for you. If you have any questions about our ministry together, we would love to tell you more about our church. We're excited to welcome today Taylor Schultz to FPC. Taylor is the Guest Relations and Development Manager at the Coney Camp and Retreat Center. In a couple of minutes, I'll invite Taylor up to share all the exciting summer camp news and family camp news and all the other offerings. And then I think Taylor's going to stay for lunch with us afterwards, so you can ask some questions as well. Presbyterian <coughs> Women has been rescheduled for tomorrow, Monday at 1.30. Am I correct on time? I'm still getting used to that time. Yep. If you're interested in purchasing a flag to be placed on the front lawn at Memorial Day week, they're $5 <coughs> each, and you can see Sissy is raising her hand if you would like to participate in that. Are there other announcements we need to make today? Yes, please. Don't forget, we are also collecting old flags that need to be retired. Um, we're going to have a retirement ceremony for Girl Scouts at our June 28th stadium. Excellent. See you for that as well. Yeah, bring me the old flag. Thank you. Other announcements? Anybody else? Can you do prayer of concerns real quick and then we'll invite Taylor. We're going to continue to pray for Edwin and Joyce Moore, Debbie Coat, who is recovering from her fall. That's uh, Anna Johnson's mom. Claudette Caton is asking for our prayers. Ricky Cram and Bill Russell. Are there others that we should mention today in our prayer of concerns? Get everyone? Maybe y'all are just eagerly anticipating Taylor. Taylor, come on up. I think that's all. Awesome. Hey, thank you, Chris. Uh, like you said, my name is Taylor. I'm from the Camp Comey. Uh, I am so happy to see so many familiar faces here in the crowd, and I'm, ha I'm more than happy to meet uh, anybody at lunch afterwards who hasn't uh, met me yet. Uh, camp Nicomi is a camp and retreat center in uh, Pleasantville, Tennessee. We run summer camps for rising second through 12th grade, and then we also have family camp, which is an intergenerational camp experience. Uh, we, we sometimes see three generations of a family come together, so um, and just experience you know nature and uh, getting closer together and closer to God outside. Um, so if you're interested in learning anything more about any of that, you can come see me at my table at uh, lunch, and I'm just so excited to be here. This is a lovely church, and meet all you people. Thank you, I think we're ready to worship. Let us worship Almighty God.
It took me a long time to learn how to whistle. I was probably uh, a teenager before I got any good at it, you know. What about uh, what about crossing your eyes? Can you cross your eyes? Oh, you can do it. There you go. Man, look, look, look at Candy. Look at that. Wow. You can you can move one of your eyes and have the other one doing this. That's like a chameleon. You're seeing him with one eye looking this way. I can roll my eyes around. Yeah. Can can you can you, can you do this with your tongue? <laughs> yeah, they see some people can do it and some people can't. I think I'm one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you do can you do the Spock thing? You know this this one?
So you're going to find as you grow up that you have talents. And you may not know why you have those talents, but there's a reason and there's a purpose. Maybe someday you'll find out, maybe you won't. You know, it might be that you have a talent and you're doing wonderful things for the world, but you don't know it yet. You know, but it's still happening nonetheless, even though you don't know it. So just keep that in mind that, that you're different for a reason. God has a purpose. Yeah. Alright, well let's let's pray real quick. Dear Lord, thank you for making us each in your name and, and in your image and giving each of us a purpose. In the Lord's name, amen. Alright. What? Lick your nose. That's a tell. That's a tell. I don't know purpose, but it is a tell. Yeah. You almost got it. How many of us want to tell Jesus to go fly a kite?
verses just 1 through 4, and then from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, 10 through 18. Listen for God's word for you this day. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Every, every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. And then from 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you should be in agreement, and that there should be no divisions among you, but that you should be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom so that the cross of Christ not be emptied of its power for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God this is the word of the Lord Thanks be to God. so an irate customer called the newspaper office loudly demanding to know where her Sunday edition was. Ma'am, said the employee, today is Saturday. The Sunday paper is not delivered until Sunday. There was a long pause on the other end of the phone, followed by a ray of recognition. Hmm, I bet that's why no one was in church today either. <laughs> One of the scholars I follow related to the narrative lectionary is Dr. Joy J. Moore. Dr. Moore is professor of biblical preaching at Luther Seminary and is also a United Methodist pastor. She still preaches almost every Sunday, even though she's a professor. This week, as I was preparing to preach our lesson, Dr. Moore commented that as we read through the letters of the early church, as we're doing now, week by week, the closer we read these texts, the more they sound like we're talking about ourselves today. Today we're in Corinth, the ancient city of trade and culture. The city of Corinth, perhaps more than any other ancient city, had a wider degree of diversity of culture and trade coming from 
all points of the known world, many different ideas about religion and faith. It's truly a city of the world in every sense of what that might mean. We see this in the book of Acts. When Paul arrives in Corinth, he meets a Jew named Aquila, who along with his wife Priscilla had immigrated from Italy after all the Jews had been kicked out of the city of Rome. Remember, just like last week, Paul preached in the synagogue in the ancient world about Jesus, who was Messiah and Savior. Of course, as a bivocational pastor myself, I absolutely love the next reference to Paul as the same. Our lesson today says that along with Priscilla and Aquila, Paul was a tent maker who stayed with them and worked each day in the marketplace. Tent making in the ancient world was not just literally making tents, but instead was working with leather and fabric of all sorts. Tanning leather was hot and smelly work, but gave Paul the opportunity to speak to all sorts of people as they came in and out of the marketplace for trading. <coughs> the city of Corinth, maybe like today, our cities and neighborhoods was a great place to share the gospel with all manners and kinds of people. The marketplace would have been filled with a, with a diversity of people and thought that no synagogue or every or ever church would have ever dreamed of. But Paul took advantage of that marketplace as he shared the gospel with the corn. But there was one thing, again, maybe similar to our own city and neighborhoods that was clearly absent city of Corinth. And that was unity. The same people Paul evangelized were divided over all sorts of things. Politics, culture, of course, religion. When Paul writes the letter we know as 1 Corinthians, he writes back to the church after he had left. He sees that the vision is there referenced. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. It's one of the things I love about Paul as pastor and preacher, we sometimes forget that he was a pastor as well as a preacher, is that how much he might remind us of our modern day preachers today, maybe even someone like me. At one point, I think it's kind of humorous. There arises a challenge about Paul and who Paul has baptized, related to who others have baptized as followers of Jesus. And Paul sort of starts down that road. Oh, yes, I baptized Crispus and Gaius, and then there was Stephanus, and, and beyond that, I don't know if I ever baptized anybody else. Kind of like he's trying to remember, but doesn't want to leave anybody out, and then he just sort of gives up. Yes, let's see, I, I think I baptized you and you, but I don't remember who else, so I'm just going to quit while I'm ahead. Paul is clearly a great man of history and faith, but it's also clearly human, with the same frailties and memory issues that many of us might have at times. But Paul is not deterred from making his point, and that point is that no human leader, frail or not, is the reason that we have faith. Moreover, no human leader should be able to divide us one from another when we have made the decision to follow Jesus Christ. That's when we're one. <laughs> God came down from heaven, he became human, he submitted himself even to death so that the world could know a kind of love for one another that is our only hope. No great theologian prior to the first century would have ever predicted that God would go that far, to act in such ways that God would prove his love for us. And if God loves us that much, then surely we should love one another as each and every one of us is worthy of God's love. In fact, no human wisdom or human leadership would have ever predicted such an outpouring of love from God. And therefore, we are not beholden to any wisdom or human leadership. In verse 17, Paul says, He didn't come to preach with eloquent wisdom. In Greek, Sophia, I got. But instead, such an idea is absolute foolishness, the wisest of human leadership. But it's that foolishness that is the only thing that can really save us. It is that foolishness that can save us from our differences and our lack of unity. Paul urges those in Corinth, cited by Chloe as agitators and dividers, to come together under the foolishness of the cross of Christ. Said more simply, if, if you could love each other a little more like God loves each of you, says Paul, 
and the world might be okay. God might, God's love might be foolishness to some, but it is our only hope as those who follow Jesus. The good news is that the church heard that message and lives it out this very day, right? We are totally unified and united as the people of Jesus Christ, wherever the church might be found. You agree that we're all united, right? I'm being sarcastic. I hope you know that. In fact, I would suggest this morning that almost nothing could be further from the truth right now at this particular time in history. Maybe that's why these lessons remind us of today. There's perhaps more debate and division now than ever, in spite of all of our calls for unity. We divide ourselves over everything. You know that because we see it all over the world every day. And the church is similarly bad. Is there anyone here that would want to suggest that the church is unified? The church is Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic and Protestant. Then there is Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox and Armenian Orthodox. Of course, Protestants are so divided up that we couldn't name all the branches and still have time for supper tonight. <laughs> Even Roman Catholics, who pride themselves as being the only true unified church. They have Jesuit Catholics and Old Catholics and Traditionalist Catholics. There are pre-Vatican II Catholics and post-Vatican II Catholics. Unity? I wish it were so. I wonder sometimes if we just haven't stopped trying. Maybe there's so much division and disunity in the world around us that we've just sort of given up on the whole concept. It's not even something that we believe is possible any longer. Last Sunday, I referenced that survey from Barna called the State of Nashville. If you were here, you remember. One other little nugget from that survey, survey found that only 32% of Christians in Nashville say they trust another religious leader other than the one that leads their community. Now, I'm no math scholar, but I think that means that seven out of 10 of our neighbors are not in unity about faith or religion. Friends, there's a lot at stake in the world today. There's a lot going on in the ancient city of Corinth, and there's a lot going on in our city today. And I still believe, like Paul, that unity and love is the best path forward. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. once said, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. And it is. It's so much harder to be in constant struggle with the others. We all know that that person, don't we? The one who is, who is always angry at someone, who is always in a tizzy. Nothing is ever right or acceptable. And those folks are hard to be around sometimes. It just takes so much work to try and, and not have an argument or to be run over by their strong opinions or feelings. So, so we avoid them. Maybe others do too. And maybe that's the reason that that person is so difficult because they're alone, and isolated, maybe by their own doing and still alone. But if God loves that person, says Paul, well then maybe we should try too. And we also know that person who's just a joy to be around, the one who lights up a room just because they're there. The person who demonstrates so much love and so much kindness that you just feel better when they're around. So the question that we have to ask ourselves are these, two really. Which kind of person are we going to be with God's help? The generous, loving, open to others kind of person, or the angry, divisive, difficult person to avoid? It's really a choice that each of us make. But secondly, what kind of person are we gonna spend our time around? Those that lift us up and give us life, or those that weigh us down? take energy from us. See, I'm sure that the, the church, our church and every church, is a reflection of those two questions. And each of us shows up here each week hoping that we are the people that God needs us to be. The loving, unified, looking out for one another kind of people. We all depend on each other for that kind of love because that kind of love really does make a difference. That's our foolishness here in this place. A 
foolishness that still believes that what we do here each and every Sunday and all the other days makes a really big difference in the community. The message of the gospel, as Paul calls it, matters to the way that we approach our lives individually, and it matters to the way our neighbors and our friends find us here collectively. I know there's something that happens to me every time I'm around all of you. God sort of heals me, makes me better from a long week sometimes where I'm tired and worn out. And then I show up here and I find you in this sanctuary, the way that you love each other, the way that you care for one another. And I depend on that, as I know many of you do too. We miss it when we're not here. The world seems a little brighter, but the love we share builds us up and then sends us back out into the world to share that with others that we come across. Paul said it, and the only way I can think of to end my message today is to quote it one more time. It's the message of the gospel according to the Apostle Paul. Let me bring it up to date a little bit and use the translation of the message. Paul wrote, I'll put it as urgently as I can. You must get along with each other. You must learn to be considerate of one another, cultivating a life in common. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer foolishness to those hell-bent on destruction, but for those on the way to salvation, that means us, brothers and sisters. It makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerful, as it turns out. It turns out, says the Apostle Paul, this is the way God works and works in the most powerful way. <coughs> Thanks be to God for foolishness. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for unity among the brothers and sisters. Join me now as we practice our unity and go before God as one as we pray together. Let us pray. <laughs> surgery and infirmity and pray that you would return them to our midst just as soon as we can. We pray for all those in the world around us that live with conflict and violence, whether it be within their family or from armies in conflict. Simply we pray for peace in our world, O oh God. Show us daily, we pray, how to be the instruments of peace that you desire. We thank you today for Taylor and the work of Nakomi. We thank you for all the ways that our Presbyterian Church and our Presbytery are engaged in the work of your mission. 
bless all who continue to serve you and your church. Grant each of us favor, the favor of resources that enable us to reach out to your children and adults with the love of our Lord. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we give life to our voices in prayer, we cast our prayers upon your loving presence, we offer the prayer Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of our Continue to worship God with the bringing forward of our tithes and our homes.
stay after for lunch today. It's the fourth Sunday, meaning the fellowship lunch, and the Greek Taylor and talk a little bit about the Comey. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord always look upon you with faith and give you peace. Amen.